Good morning everyone, how are you doing? This is Amanda, I do hope that you're well. So today is the 13th of August and we're gonna get straight down to it, to it today. Um, I just want to get this message out because I feel it's vitally important. Thank you very much if you've actually tuned in to watch this because it might not be maybe the easiest subject matter but it's a vitally important one that we do bring up for discussion and more than anything that we stand up for the right for freedom of speech. Um, those of you that follow me on my Facebook and uh, Instagram page, both of which are called Angelic Celestial Colours, you'll know that there's been a little bit of a theme over the last two weeks. It's been growing where I've been referencing freedom of speech. Um, and sadly, yesterday on the 12th of August, we had Sir Salman Rushdie um, attacked and knifed, I think about 15 times, um, just before he was about to give a speech in New York City. Um, the actual venue is supposed to be a real bastion for free speech. Lots of free thinkers are invited there to share their thoughts, their books, their philosophies, their views of life. Um, and yeah, I mean, this headline for me just sums it up in one of the uh, papers today over here in the UK. And it just says, Sir Salman Rushdie, a life spent fighting for free speech, attacked at a bastion of free speech. And as, um, to be honest, I woke up this morning, I obviously sent prayers for him last night, as many of you did as well, um, for him to stay with us. I did pull some cards as well last night. I'm going to show you what they are. I'm going to redo it today um, because they say a lot. But yeah, I sort of was in dread turning on my phone because I thought I would really hope this guy is still with us. And he is, but uh, at the moment he's on a ventilator um, he is unable to speak. Hopefully that is short term. I don't know. There isn't a lot of information coming out. I think he was stabbed in his stomach, his neck. Um, he's lost the use of one arm and he's probably going to lose an eye. Um, straight away when I heard that about his eye, he's always had very, um, uh, interesting eyes I've always thought um, an interesting looking man and his eyes I don't know are just very uh, captivating um, but the uh, the saying from I think it was Gandhi an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind absolutely came to mind with regards to this because even if you objected to what he had to say and I totally understand this is linked into religion and um, fundamentalism as well, uh, because there are many Muslims, of course, who are appalled at this act of violence and have spoken out um, and reminding people about the peace-loving nature of their faith. But there's always going to be people from any faith and any religion, sadly, that have used religion as an excuse for violence. And I shared this quote this morning from Salman Rushdie. I don't know when he said it, probably years ago. And the quote is, from the beginning, men used God to justify the unjustifiable. And let's actually just repeat that again. From the beginning, men used God to justify the unjustifiable. And if you think back, for example, to the Christian Crusades, you think back probably to um, so many of the wars and so much of the fighting in our world, which has been done in God's name, and at the end of the day, God is love. God isn't war. Um, it's man that's made that aspect of war, going off to fight for your country, justified. And I'm going back to the Crusades, that type of energy. But we could bring it up to present day as well. So that quote, yeah, from the beginning, men used God to justify the unjustifiable is really in our face today. Um, I'm going to light a candle for him. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief resume and it's going to be very brief in terms of who he is um, and the controversy around him. For those of you that don't know, because I was quite shocked last night that people of my age group were saying they'd never heard of him. Um, I can understand younger people having never heard of him, but uh, I guess there are people that, I don't know, maybe they weren't on their path or weren't aware of more global issues 
when they were younger. Um, but, you know, this is a guy for three decades, over three decades, has been living with a death penalty over his head, um, a fatwa that was um, pronounced by one of the Ayatollahs in Iran because he had the audacity to write the book The Satanic Verses, which basically was a novel, but it challenged some of the thinking um, around, you know, um, what Muslims believe. And there were many uprisings in the world. I remember the protests very clearly. And I also remember the horror, the sheer horror of that ruling coming down. And even as a, I don't know how old I was then, but I would have been in my 20s, wouldn't I? Uh, not particularly on my spiritual path, consciously, just being absolutely horrified at what had happened to him and imagining how awful it would be and projecting forward into the future. How is this man going to live the rest of his life having had the penalty of death put on him? You know, the Ayatollah basically... Um, ordered Muslims to kill the author in retaliation for the book that had been written. Um, it's also worth noting that Salman Rushdie is... Um, let's just do a little bit actually about who he is and where he was born. And I'd also like to look at his numerology um, because he is a fascinating character. Let me just get his um, photograph up as well so I can show that to you. Because as I say, I just keep going back to his eyes are quite extraordinary. Um, here we go. Let's have a let's have a photograph of him. Um, he wears glasses, so it's quite hard to see his eyes actually. <laughs> this is of him as a older man. Uh, which photograph do I want to show us? Uh, actually, here's one without glasses. That's when he was a younger man. But he's got very um, interesting eyes, very profound, wise, deep eyes. He's said to be one of the, or if not the, most controversial author of, of the last century. Um, a brilliant mind. I have to confess, I have never read his book. Um, I've no great desire to read his book, but I will always stand up for his right to have written it. That's the whole point of freedom of speech. And that's why we're here today talking about this. Yeah, this is him as an older, an older gentleman. OK, so he, he was living in um, the States where he had basically sought refuge and had been living for a number of years um, with, you know, peace and um, freedom. Uh, but anyway, let's just have a little look. So one of the most he, one of the most controversial books in recent literary history Salman Rushdie's The Satanic Verses was published three decades ago and it immediately set off angry demonstrations from all over the world, some of them violent. A year later, in 1989, Iran's supreme leader, the Ayatollah Khomeini, I know I've said that wrong, issued a fatwa or religious ruling ordering Muslims to kill the author. Um, he was born in India to a Muslim family but by then was a British citizen living in the UK. He was forced to go into protective hiding for the greater part of a decade. Um, and there have been other people that actually have been murdered linked into this book. Um, I believe the Japanese translator for it, because it's been published in all countries, was murdered. There was obviously the incident, uh, Charlie Hebdo in Paris, um, which I think was linked, might be wrong there. Um, but basically, it's a fictional, I'm just reading from a, a website here, it's a fictional retelling of the birth of Islam's key events. Um, and some of some of the people who defend Rushdie say um, it was intended to explore whether it is possible to separate fact from fiction. Um, since its publication, Rushdie has argued that religious texts should be open to challenge. Why can't we debate Islam, Rushdie said in a tw 2015 interview. Is it, it is possible to respect individuals, to protect them from intolerance, while being sceptical about their ideas and even criticising them ferociously. Um, the fatwa was lifted in 1998 after that Ayatollah died, um, but 
my cards are saying that there's still a bounty on his head. That's what I was picking up last night. So we're going to have a little look at this and look at how this links into the whole debate around freedom of speech and more than anything shine a loving spotlight onto it and remind ourselves of the importance of standing up for free speech because it feels as though there are many times in our life where we might passionately believe something or hold something to be true but through fear of ridicule, through, and I'm not necessarily talking about, you know, the subject matter of his book now, I'm just talking generally, um, for fear of ridicule, for fear of um, being, you know, the one out on uh, a limb, as it were, you know, uh, not with the crowd, um, we may stay silent, or there may be people out there that are saying things that we passionately agree with, but yet we don't support them in public. Um, because again, fear that somebody might see that we've liked something or commented on something. And I think, you know, the brave warriors in our world who are actually out there on the collective stage and have chosen such big soul contracts to come in and show us as a collective what is happening to freedom of speech. Um, and also what happens when you maybe stand up for something that others don't like um, but that's still part of freedom of speech. It seems to be very easy to say I stand up for freedom of speech when it's something that we agree with and we all nod our head and say, oh, yes, they're, absolutely. But then as soon as somebody says something that you don't necessarily agree with or you don't like or you get triggered by, these shutters can come down. Metatron's just showing me the, the energy of, a, a, of shop shutters just coming down and it's like the shop's closed you know uh, because we don't sell that we don't say that you're not allowed to do that and indeed I was reading something last night which was saying that with regards to the book the satanic verses it probably would not even be allowed to be published now in 2022 um, and that should make us all question you know why is that why you know why uh, why was something once OK and now not OK? Um, there's a brilliant, I, I sort of try to save little, well, I'm sure like you do, things that I see, quotes that I see that I think are inspiring. And there's one, feels like there's a whole series of videos that would be great to do on the, the great philosophers of our day. And indeed, this guy may, may very well be one of the great philosophers of his day. As I say, I've not read any of his books, but I know that they are of a different level. They would make me think. They would probably give my, my brain, you know, ache, but it would make me think. And I think we live in a dumbed down age where people don't necessarily want to do that. They don't want to question the narrative on anything. But yeah, this is another quote from Voltaire. I've quoted him a few times recently. Um, and the quote is, judge a man by his questions rather than his answers. And I love that. Um, and Voltaire is also the one who basically said something along the lines of, uh, I, will, I might not agree with what you say, but I will defend to your death the right for you to say it. And it seems as though when we look at somebody like Salman Rushdie, and we could also bring in people like uh, Julian Assange, you know, uh, a different type of thing, really, but same strand. Um, it's as though they do these, you know, they bring forth truths or they, they in Salman's case, they write things. Uh, this was a novel at the end of the day. And then, you know, justice is served on them unfair justice and the world turns away now not all of us turn away I'm very aware of that I might very well be speaking to the converted here but I hope this video gets out to a few people that maybe haven't seen my work before haven't questioned things in any way in terms of you know what we are presented with what we read um, is is it accurate is it actually telling the truth or is it a version of somebody else's truth? And is it okay to question? Is it okay to question a official narrative, a current narrative, even if everybody else is going along with that narrative? Um, but I've also got the two eyes in my head. I mean, that's quite interesting. Yeah, I have got two eyes in my head. But equally, I'm, I'm talking about two words with the letter I, because I keep being shown by Metatron. Um, 
those of you that watched my last video, which I think was the Lionsgate one, I used the word ignorance and I corrected myself because I felt as though I'd, you know, maybe um, said, I had said something was a bit that it was a bit judgy that you know that you're ignorant it felt as though it was a bit of a um, an insult and then I went sort of tried to go back into a channeling mode and it came out again and one of you in the comments thank you very much you reminded me that actually ignorance is not necessarily um, a fault it's basically just a lack of knowledge it's something that can easily be corrected we don't have to remain ignorant. We don't have to remain as people that don't ask questions. Um, we don't have to be ignorant on anything. If you take it into a completely different arena, again, maybe a controversial arena, but I think this needs to be said as well. You know, I'm carrying a few extra pounds at the moment and trying to lose them. So I'm putting my, you know, I'm not a beast, but I've put a bit of weight on, which I need to lose. So it's very hard sometimes to lose weight um, and that can be contributed to all sorts of things it's also to do with what's in our food and the sugars that are you know given into everything blah 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 but the point is if you think about ignorance um, with the exception of people that might put on weight because of some medical condition or you know something like that the information another eye the information there's three eyes is out there uh, to how to turn it around to what you need to do to basically have a healthy body. It's, there's no excuse really for, well, I didn't know that, you know, if, if I eat sugar, it's going to make me fat. Or if I eat too much fat, it's going to clog up my arteries. Uh, I'm sure, you know, in law, there's something where ignorance is not an excuse. I'm sure that's right, isn't it? You, you can't turn up to a court of law um, as an example, OK, say you get a speeding fine and you go to court and you're doing 90 miles per hour in a 40 mile per hour zone and you turn to the judge and say, well, I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't realise that, you know, I was ignorant of the fact that it was only a 40 mile per hour zone. They'll, you know, they'll, they'll throw you in the cell. <laughs> it's not an excuse. So ignorance is one word I wanted to bring up. But the polar opposite uh axes almost is um, intelligence but remember intelligence has many different facets it's also to do with emotional intelligence it's to do with uh, IQ intelligence now some people are more blessed than others I understand that but we can all improve from whence we started um, one of my stories in my life which I don't particularly want to go on about in this video because it's not about me but I will say it because it's appropriate was that when I was 11 yes that magic number again I was put into a remedial stream because I was behind in maths and French uh, remedial stream was basically stream F so from A to F I was in the bottom stream with people that couldn't even read or write and it was my father because I'm just back from seeing my father who said to me, he said, God, Amanda, he said, I remember when you were in the F stream. And he said, I remember how hard you fought to get yourself out of there. And I did. And I went on, you know, and I, I got my O levels. I got my A levels. I got a 2-1 degree. I'm not an unintelligent person. But it's been through hard work, diligence, perseverance, but also just having the, the, the curiosity to open up a book, to want to learn a lot of ignorance is actually because people don't want to learn and people can stay um, at a at an unintelligent level uh, because they don't want to try. I'm being I'm, I'm hearing the word amoeba in my head. So those of you, those scientists that follow me, please help me out here again. Thank you very much. You did last time when I asked a scientific question. There's something about the amoeba. You know, the, how does the amoeba move from being an amoeba into something that is a more coherent, conscious, walking, talking, living being? You know, it's all through a process of um, continual growth and flow, but also the determination to want to grow from that amoeba into something else the will basically a lot of people just want to stay a bit like frog spawn you know i'm using that analogy because we've had it in the garden 
Bella's swimming pool got tadpoles in it. <laughs> it's really gross. But the point is, it's like some people just want to stay at that tadpole type energy. You know, if I just float around in the water and I don't really want to become a frog, I just want to stay here in this state. You know, it's OK, really. It's not OK. I, I personally don't think it's not it's not who I am anyway. And it's not here. It's not what I'm here to teach. I'm not about lowest common denominator. I'm about trying to push us all and myself it's been the story of my whole life higher because that's what I came here to do to learn to grow to evolve so we've got these two axes anyway let's go back um intelligence and ignorance and um and then I think that you know this all ties into this whole debate around uh freedom of speech because some people just want to stay ignorant to the fact that it's that it's even being eroded um, they don't want to educate themselves in terms of what's happening to our world. Um, they just want to bury their head in, their sa in the sand. So this is really like a big trumpet call, this video, to say, come on, you know, this is now a time for us all to stand up for people that are brave enough to put their head above the parapet and speak, OK, to write, to produce, to, you know... Um, do things that we may, might not be able to. Um, let me go back to the cards that I pulled for him last night. And it was interesting because I heard the news and I was really shocked. It's one of those pieces of news you're not expecting. You know, we all know the type of things that are in the news at the moment and there might be updates and blah de blah I'm not saying they're not important. They are. But this was something that just came out well it came from the past it's like a memory from 33 years ago of hearing about this man's you know pre uh, predicament and suddenly here we are and I went to bed last night and I, I said on social media I said it just can't end like this please god it doesn't end like this this would be this would just be such a sad ending and then I saw a quote from Salman Rushdie himself which he'd said months previously where he said something along the li lines of, call me, call me naive, but I, I believe there's going to be a happy ending, something like that. Um, let me just see if I can find that quote really quickly. Uh, Salman Rushdie, happy ending. Because that's what we want. We want a happy ending to this story, uh, whether we're going to get it or not. I'm not sure. Um, mm, pausing my camera hold on guys yeah it's a short little quote it just says I'm stupidly optimistic even through those bad years I always believed there would be a happy ending so yeah um, let's hope there can be but um what a brave soul, what a brave soul contract that he chose. Um, these are the cards that I pulled last night for him and I'm going to show them to you and then I'm going to pull again. Uh, it's a brand new deck that only arrived in my house over the weekend so I've never, I've never used it before. It's called the Dream Makers Tarot by Liz Houston. It's quite unusual, quite unusual, got very unusual imagery on it which is great. And this was the one I wanted to use for it. So I, the first thing that happened, let me light a candle before I do anything else. This is for him and this is also for free speech. A candle for free speech, a candle for Salmon. Okay. Um, the, last night I tried to light a candle for him twice and the wick would not light. And I took that as a bad sign, but still sent the light. Um, and I pulled these cards and the first one that came out was the Eight of Wands. So can you see, can you see this card if I hold it up properly? Um, so the Eight of Wands is usually fast movement, okay? Um, as I'm just tuning into this now, I'm hearing, uh, they, it also represents the, um, the knife, okay? Uh, the knife that came from nowhere very quickly. But I was really struck by these two figures. And this almost looks like sort of like an angel that's trying to pull this figure towards a different realm i.e probably towards the light so i felt like he was it was like an energy of fighting for his life he was certainly in um 
surgery for quite a number of hours last night. But if you look at the figure that the angel's trying to pull more towards the light, or um, this figure is sort of quite stuck and wanting to stay where they are. And they're actually covered with poisoned I ivy. Um, they've got ivy all around them. And, uh, but they've also got butterfly wings. Um, I just need to look at the card again. Hold on, and then I'll show it again. So it just feel it, what my impression was that he was bound to something in this life that he didn't want to basically let go. Um, but there definitely was a moment where I think it was uh, life or death stuff. Um, the next card that came out was the Two of Wands. Um, and again, this is an unusual deck. In the image here, we've got a figure without a head. It's a headless uh, person. And I just heard the words off with his head. OK, so that would have been the... Um, the ruling, the fatwa, off with his head, two of wands, that was the vision. That's what actually he's been faced with his whole life, that when he looks into the mirror, um, his fear, which is very real, even if he may have buried it or be, managed to get on with his life, has been that this is the fate that awaits him. Um, then we have the card of the Four of Swords, uh, which can be a card of rest and recuperation. It's also a card of illness. Um, and that's pretty obvious why that was there. And it felt like a very long night last night for those that loved him and those that wanted him to stay. A very long night of waiting. But I also got the card of strength. The card of strength, which is a positive omen. Okay, the card of strength. Really, all of his strength to stay and it's interesting because if he had died or if he does die hopefully that is not the case um the the man who attacked him would have become a martyr oh, sorry he yeah he would have become a um a hero uh in the, in some people's eyes um and actually i was appalled last night on twitter I was just watching the trending of Salman Rushdie's name on Twitter. And in the UK, it was the number two trending uh, piece all through the night. I think it still is today. But there was a lot of uh, people um, coming it on, basically saying that they applauded what had happened and hoped that he wouldn't make it. So, you know, this is just really vile stuff. Um, but he's got strength of character. He's got the strength of character to stay. He's got a will to stay here. Um, we also got the three of wands hanging on a cliff edge, literally hanging on a cliff edge. Hanging on a cliff edge. Um, undecided. I'm going to pull them again this morning and see what we get. There was also some other cards last night linked into money. I can't remember which card it was now, so I didn't pull it out of the deck. Um, but there were money cards and it made me think that uh, there was a bounty on his head. So whoever this guy was who's done it uh, may well have been doing it on behalf of uh, another organisation or government uh, or association. So it feels as though there's money involved in this as well uh, to take him out of the equation. The other expression that came to mind very much last night was the pen is mightier than the sword the pen is mightier than the sword and if you take something like a book you can never once it's out it's out okay once the cat's out of the bag the cat is out of the bag and there is no way that his writings will ever be erased if anything what has happened However it goes for him, um, his writings will, the prominence of them will just increase and increase and increase. And more and more people will be um, wanting to read them. Right, so the card that's just pulled out of the deck is the Queen of Pentacles. Now she kept coming up last night and I'm not quite sure who the Queen of Pentacles is. It might be uh, his partner, his wife. I think he's been married four times actually. So there's quite a number of women um, around him 
um, and I'm not quite sure why she's showing right now. Let's just see. Anyway, let's just see what wants to come out. I'm just going to literally ask Spirit, what is there to say? What what can we know? Um, what would you like to say with regards to Salman Rushdie's fate at this time? Salman Rushdie. Five cards I'm hearing. First sensation I'm getting as I'm uh, shuffling the cards is my ears are getting muffled. Like I'm at a high altitude and it's like my ears are starting to get blocked. And I'm hearing that there are people in high places who literally, it's like they've got their fingers in their ears. They don't want to hear about him. They don't want to hear about this case. They don't want to be reminded of it. They don't want to get involved in it. They don't want to say anything about it. Um, they just wish the whole thing would go away. Uh, we've got the King of Cups on the uh, that has come out now. So we've got the Queen of Pentacles and the King of Cups. Um, I think that must be his partner. Let's just have a look at whether he's married now. Um, I know he has been. Is he married now? Uh, doesn't look like he's married now. Anyway, we've got a man and a woman. You see, look at this. Oh no, that is a cup that guy's holding. Very interesting cards, aren't they? You see that? It's almost set against a sort of, I don't know, Lowry type landscape. Quite bleak, quite industrial, with the moon in the sky. Again, no head. The moon is the head. There's what looks like the Eiffel Tower right in the background of that picture. Can you see that? Yeah, it's not my eyes. You might not be able to see that. There's a figure there that looks a bit like the shape of the Eiffel Tower. Now, I do know that Macron is one of the leaders that has actually come out and said something, um, has stood up for Salman Rushdie in the last 24 hours. I just, I heard that, I noticed that. I don't know what that's got to do with it, but okay, five cards, Salman Rushdie, Spirit. This is literally like I'm being shown a glass of water or a pool of water, and the water is so thick with mud you can hardly see through it. Um, it might be that I'm being prevented from seeing something as well, but let's just see if I can get anything else. got the strength card again there's a woman around him it might be an ex-wife or it might be somebody else who is going to be a tower of strength to him and who is giving him the strength and willing him on could even be his mother you know could even be his mother we've got the seven of swords by the way that keeps showing on the bottom of the deck so I'm going to take that um could be his mother I don't know whether his mother is in spirit I assume she probably is, but maybe she's not. I don't know. I'm picking up the influence of his mother. Um, let me just have a quick look at that. Salman Rushdie, mother. Who was his mother? Uh, he was born in Bombay on the 19th of June 1947 during the British Raj to an Indian Kashmiri Muslim family. Um, his mother was a teacher. His mother was a teacher. Okay. I'm picking her up very strongly. Strong influence around him. Yeah. We've got the Seven of Swords on the bottom of the deck, which is deception. Um... Oh, not liking that. OK, what I'm hearing, because people are saying, why was the venue not better protected? How could somebody just get to him so easily? 
you know, he was there in front of a crowd of people. Even if the fatwa had been lifted, he's still, he's still a man with a target on his head. So um, why was he not better protected? And what, what I'm hearing is there was an enemy in the camp because apparently this guy walked in with a pass. The man who attacked him had a pass and was able to get in there. Um, so there was a betrayal and it feels, I don't know whether it's somebody within his circle or just, I'm not saying it's anybody linked to the venue, but it's, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an enemy in the camp. There's somebody who's not what they appear to be who literally wanted to stab him in the back and got somebody else to do it. That's what I'm feeling there. So I don't like the energy of that Seven of Swords at all. Tell me, is there anything else to say about that Seven of Swords energy? Metatron saying it doesn't really help to know anymore because if it wasn't that person, it would have been somebody else because he's, he's, he's talking about the bounty, um, the bounty on this man's head, the money. Um, somebody was paid money to uh, to betray in this way or somehow get that guy the pass. Or, and it isn't necessarily the person that gave the pass. It's more intricate than that. It's all very murky and misty. We've got a card here, which is the Fates, number um, 10. Um, this was... This was been this was fated, and this has been fated for decades. The book was fated as well. Um, the this whole lifetime and how it's panned out with him is how it actually was meant to be. It's why he came and incarnated. He was meant to challenge the status quo. He was meant to challenge this particular faith. He was meant to challenge people's. Um, he was just meant to, he was just meant to be the questioner um card number 10 the fates yeah that is the wheel of fortune i'm sure and there's a little little saying here which says an unexpected yet positive twist in the game of life at the edge of time stand the fates um who preside over the fate of humanity and gods alike the oldest stories state that they are the fatherless daughters of Nyx, primeval goddess of night. Card 10 is traditionally the Wheel of Fortune, but here on a similar thread we have the Fates. They are the embodiment of the thread of life as well as the presiding forces over it. Each of them play an important role in constructing the predetermined courses of events. Clotha, the spinner, spins the thread of life and presides over the present. Laches, the allotter, measures the length of each human life and presides over the future. Altropos, the inflexible, cuts the thread of life presiding over the past. Wow. It says here, the word fate comes to us from the Latin word fatum, which is interpreted as that which has been spoken. Therefore, fate is the natural order in the universe and things that cannot be changed. Yeah, this is just such a big soul contract he came in with. It was fated. Whatever happens is fated. And um, that is very, very clear. OK, let's just have a couple of cards going forward for Salman Rushdie. Going forward, Salman Rushdie. Salman Rushdie, going forward, going forward, Salman Rushdie, going forward, Salman Rushdie. The Five of Cups, a sense of disappointment and what has been lost. On the bottom, the King of Swords, who would be, uh, he, that could very well be interpreted as, as the author. OK, he probably will still keep writing as long as he survives. We've also got the chariot as well showing up. Um, but, you know, his, his arm's being damaged. I wonder whether it's the arm that writes. If that is the case and if he survives, of course, you can speak your words now, can't you? You don't have to physically write them. But, you know, I said that expression earlier, the, the, the pen is mightier than the sword. And this guy has got a quill pen in his hand um, and an open book. Oh, he's got a sword as well. Oh, my God. Of course, he's the king of swords. 
So the pen is mightier than the sword. Oh gosh, look at that card again. The thing that's more fearful is not the sword. It's not what they can do to the physical body. That's not, that's, that's not, that's not the thing that's got the greatest strength. That's what I'm trying to say. The thing that's got the greatest strength is the pen in his hand and what he's already written. So whatever they did to him, whatever they would try to do to him in the future, with a sword, with a weapon, with an instrument, and this also can be words, people that want to cut him down with words, he will always, seems a bit of a glib thing to say, seeing as he's lying in a hospital bed on a ventilator, I want to say have the last laugh. What I mean by that is he, he, he ultimately wins. Um, is that a cigarette in his hand? Sorry, I've got, I haven't got my glasses on. I think, it, is it? You tell me. That, that picture, because it almost feels like he's flipping a finger, you know, it's at, 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 at those who try to bring him down. Um, it's like, you're not, you're not going to get me. You'll never get me. Even if you took my physical body, you can't take, you can't take the writing that I've already done. You can't take what I've already delivered. Um... It's just interesting that there's one finger sit, 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 standing up. There's a finger, there's a sword, and there's a pen. I think it's something, it's a nod to this injured arm, this, this, this hand that I'm concentrating on. But we've also got the chariot. The chariot, which implies forward movement from this pretty broken place, the Five of Cups pretty broken mourning what has been lost but it feels as though best case scenario he's back up on his feet he carries on with the chariot he writes again even more you know not necessarily linked into the satanic verses he's written many books he's a prolific author a brilliant author apparently as I say I've not written his I've not um, read any of his stuff but he will carry that on even if it's like he's transcribing it, it will still happen. Or this is the spirit of his writing lives on. You know, what he's already written. Is he going to be okay? Is he going to survive? That's what I asked last night and they weren't really giving me the answer. Is he going to survive? Salman Rushdie, is he going to survive? Six of Cups, the past. The devil on the bottom of the deck. The empress. The emperor. Hold on a minute. A lower, lower energy, a lower energy which wants death and destruction to him has been after him for a long time and is in the past position, even though it's come back now. But we've got the emperor and the empress. There's a very strong masculine and feminine energy around him. I hope that's him in the future with a strong partner um, but the empress of course is also fertility and life the emperor doesn't look like he's budging very much from his position his exalted position is what I'm hearing and here that would be Salman as the um, as the emperor he's not going to be knocked off his throne there's new life to come but by no means is it easy we've got the nine of swords no means is it easy no means is it easy He's chosen a very, very hard path, very hard life. 
I don't know guys, it's still, um, I'm still wanting to say it's still undecided how all this pans out, but that's what I'm getting today. Let's now go back to the topic of free speech to wrap up this video, but let me just have some water first. And let me just say that I think if you've been shocked by what's happened to him, disturbed by what's happened to him, um, let us give a rallying call and let us remind ourselves how important it is to stand up for people and things that we care passionately about and to get behind those that are brave enough to speak and do and show what it looks like to live in a free world, which is that um, freedom of speech has to be something that is protected. I think I'm going to leave it there for today. I think I've gone as far as I can with this particular video. Um, I did get one other deck out. and Maybe I'll just pull one card from this just to see a final, final message. This is The Wild Unknown Archetypes by Kim Kranz. Um, great creator, great creator, great artist, great writer. You know, that card comes out straight away, a vessel, a vessel through which her higher self and consciousness flows through into her decks. In the same way that, you know, Salman as a writer, his consciousness, his higher self flowed something through into his decks. The fact that others don't agree with it, don't approve of it, doesn't mean it doesn't have a right to exi not exist. So it doesn't mean it doesn't have a right to exist. Okay, let's just see if there's one card. Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. The hunter. The hunter. To be honest, <coughs> many of us are being hunted down for speaking our truth at this time because they want to put us back into a box of conformity, of it only exists if it's within this box. Anything outside of the box is not acceptable. You can't say what is not out ins inside the box. So it's like being hunted, being hunted down like a wild animal. But the wild animal, you, me, anybody that stands up for freedom of speech or embodies freedom of speech, we're heading towards the light. The darkness is behind us, not in front of us. So I actually think that's quite a um, empowering card. It's acknowledging where we're at, this darkness that wishes to consume and erode and pervade our life and say, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't say that, you can't go there, you can't whatever but we're moving out of it. It's as though half of the body of the horse is still in that really difficult place where it just feels as though there is only darkness. There is only darkness. I can't see the light. I can't see this ever getting any better. What's happened to Salmon? What's happened to other people? It's just getting worse and worse and worse. The world is getting worse and worse and worse. But half of the horse is already out of the worst bit of the storm and it can see the horizon on the future. It can see, sorry, it can see the horizon in the future. I want to go back to intelligence as well. We'll just say one thing about the need for self-improvement. That's another I, improvement, but self-improvement, moving away from ignorance, moving away from dumbing down, moving away from just staring at the bloody box What's on the TV tonight? Sitting down in front of some soap opera with stupid characters that you don't even care about. Or maybe you do, that's even worse. And I've been there and I've done that. I've loved them all in the past. But it's mindless numbing down a lot of the time. And I think we know it is. Um, switch off the box and do something that is actually going to stimulate your mind. You know, having just been up with my dad in Yorkshire, there was this thing that happened 
we had a, a, a dinner party on the last night and um, it was unexpected and it was beautiful. And my dad is somebody who always loved poetry as a young man. In fact, I think he was in the debating society as well. And so he liked to debate. Uh, he was also a political canvasser. He was, he's all about the debate. Um, but he also loved language and he loved the sound of language. And he loved poetry. And he gave my daughter a book of, book of poetry that was his mother's, actually. And as he gave it to her, there was about six of us, seven of us in the room. He said, right, I want us all to read a poem out of the book. And uh, he had chosen the poem that each of us want, needed to read from the book to the group. And we were maybe a little bit uncomfortable. It's like, oh, I'm not used to doing that. And it's going to be a bit weird, isn't it, reading a poem out? And they were quite long poems and they were all rhyming. And every person read, uh, including myself, and we all did well. And we all enjoyed hearing each other deliver a beautiful poem. But more than anything, this might get me choked up, but there was one moment in particular, and I can't remember who was reading it. I think it might have been my brother. And my dad was just listening with his eyes closed to the sound of my brother's voice reading this poem. And my dad was in a different world. He was just, he was literally, he was with the prose. He was with the, he was with the poetry. He was living every single word of it. And it was, it was so beautiful to see. It was so beautiful to see how moved he was by the language, by the prose. And these poems weren't about love and, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that. They were actually about really quite difficult subjects. Uh, they're about the difficult bits of life. And um, it was just something very special. And it was about stimulating the intellect and evolving. And that's the type of world that I want to live in. Not the type of world where we're all just dumbed down, given the book that we're allowed to read and nothing else. Salman Rushdie's books were burned in the 1980s, um, taken off the shelves. And one of you said to me that because it was so bad, a group of a group of publishers got together to publish his books, or particularly the Satanic Verses, to reduce the threat level to an individual publisher f for doing so. And it's the only way we can get round this. It's the only way is to come together and to um, and to push back, but also to remember the beauty of language. And those of us that have the gift, somebody like Sam that has the gift of words and language. It needs to be prized, even if there are parts of it that you don't like. As I say, he's written many books. I believe one of his most famous books was, um, was it called Midnight Something? Let me just have a look. Because actually there's something about Midnight. Let me just get it. Midnight, Midnight's Children. He actually won a prize for Midnight's Children. Um, about India's transition from British colonial rule to independence. Um, it, it won many prizes and uh, the Booker Prize, that's right, yeah. So that was one of his books that he wrote. The other thing I will just quickly say is that I had been reading another book I've mentioned before to you, I've nearly finished it now, called The Midnight Library by Matt Hay, I think it is. And in The Midnight Library, you go into this space between life and death, this grey zone, this midnight library, and it brings up, um, it brings up themes of the multiverse, the fact that we're, we, we all are living different lives, multiple lives, parallel lives, lying one on top of the other. But special people get this chance to be in what's called the Midnight Library. It's a novel. It's, an, it's a fictional novel. Um, and they're, they're, they, they can see the different lives they could have led if they just did one thing differently. And I felt last night that he was in that Midnight Library zone. He was between life and death when he was on the operating theatre table and so I'm so glad he's still with us now um, but I know and I, I, I think he said this anyway that he doesn't regret what he did in publishing that book I think he's on record of saying he knew there was going to be a bit of a furore about it but he expected he expected a bit of that but he didn't expect the full backlash but at a soul level he did know it 
he signed up to show and be brave and courageous. And even if you hated it, you didn't like it, it offended you on religious grounds, he still had the right to write it. And I'll defend that absolutely to my dying breath. Okay, remember that's what we are. The other thing about the black horses, they're very protected, very protected energy. All of that light, keep moving towards that. Freedom of speech will come back, but only if we fight for it. Lots of love, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye for now. Bye.